Well, let's begin with a prayer. Randy, you want to start us off with a little prayer? Uh, I think I might be able to handle that. Yeah. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come together today to break open your word, we ask that you send your graces down upon us to a help with the Holy Spirit as we prepare our homilies this weekend to reach out to those in our assemblies and let them hear your voice and guide them in their journey with you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, Randy. Do you want to start with the very first reading as well? I can. Um, wisdom. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. There is no God besides you who have the care of all that you need to show you have not unjustly condemned for your might is a source of justice. Your mastery over all things make you lenient to all. For you show your might when the perfection of your power is disbelieved. And in those who know you, you rebuke temerity. But though you are the master of might, you judge with clemency and with much lenience you govern us. For power, whenever you will, attend you. And you taught your people by these deeds that those who are just must be kind and you gave your children good ground for hope that you would permit repentance for their sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Yes, so the, so the book of wisdom is written about 50 years before the birth of Christ. And often when you read the book of wisdom, you, you find sometimes references back to the history of the with, that's recounted in the Hebrew Bible, but maybe little summaries of history. Uh, and so what's beautiful about this first reading right here is it talks about how God has the mastery over all things, but he can still be lenient to us. Yeah. He, can for, he, he can forgive us of our sins. And wow. there's, something, there's something beautiful about the relationship between God being all powerful and his desire to forgive his people. So you see the concepts of, you know, but, uh, but though you are master of might, you judge with clemency and with much, much lenience you govern us. And so it reflects on the fact that God has continually forgiven his people. Um, and so one great example is Exodus chapter 34, when Moses receives the commandments for the second time, and right as he's receiving the commandments for the second time, the Lord reveals himself to Moses. He passes by as Moses is hidden in the rock, uh, and he declares how he's merciful and compassion, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Uh, and so you know, even though the history of Israel is sometimes a tragedy because of their disobedience, you also see the beauty of, of God's uh, desire to forgive his people. So this first, this, there's something beautiful about this reading. And I, and I think one thing that I, many of our young people um, might lack is a confidence in God's mercy. And this is, this is so important to us as Catholics to have this great confidence in God's desire to forgive us of our sins. Um, and so that's what draws us back to church. It's what draws us back to the sacraments, back to the sacrament yeah. of confession is that we are confident that God wants to forgive us of our sins, and he wants to, to help us to learn even from our biggest or greatest mistakes. Any thoughts uh, on this reading? Um, I had one, and it suddenly went out of my mind. Yeah. Like, like... <laughs> Obviously, he's a very merciful God. It's, I like this. And mm -hmm. for those who know you, you rebuke temerity. He just what's came back. What's he talking about, Father? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one right there. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I have to I have to look that one up. Let's see. Uh, it's uh, probably right around verse thirteen. I could I could look. I'd have to look that one up for you, and I, I right. can do so. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but uh, I'll put it in the notes. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll put it in the okay. notes. Yeah. All right. You know what I like though is the is the concept of hope and and repentance. Hope yeah. and and repentance. That's a that's a that's a beautiful concept right there as well. So very clear. E exactly. Exactly. And 
So like there's a there's a direct concept a connection between you know our you know the ground of hope that we have in God's desire for our repentance. Um, very good. Did All the right. Hebrew, let's... Did the Hebrew people then need to be reminded of that continuously? I know we do. <laughs> of course they did. Got it. Yeah, they they I mean and they they did, but you know they made a lot of mistakes and it, and so yeah. wis wisdom. Wisdom is rich in, it, uh, in the Second Temple period, uh -huh. and, and it's in the latter part of the Second Temple period. So Israel went into exile in Babylon for 70 years. After 70 years, they came back, and they, they built another tem temple called the Second Temple. It was not close to as glorious as the First Temple. It did not have an Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there was no Davidic king on the throne. There was no visible presence of, of God, the Shekinah, as it's known, uh, which some uh, speak about when they speak about the first temple uh, and also the desert journey. Uh, and so the second temple period, there, there, there's, there is a time of reflection where Israel can look at its history and say, wow, we messed up, but somehow God brought us back to this land and right. allowed us to reestablish ourselves, even though it's not a complete reestablishment. There, there was a lot of incompleteness in the Second Temple period as well. Uh, and so wisdom is written in that period uh, just before the birth of Christ, 50 AD. Uh, the Second Temple was destroyed in 70 AD, or 50 BC, 50 BC. Uh, and the Second Temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I've got, um, I've got two comments to make one i'm going to save till we get to the gospels okay uh, very good but the the first one uh when i read this what popped in my mind was um god's infinite patience yeah. for these people which also kind yeah. of flows into the gospel at least in my view uh the fact right. that it, it talks about governs with lenience Right. And, patience, and it just patience just seems kind of I mean, the Israelis time and time and time again broke their covenant with God, and yet he didn't just smite them out. Right. He was patient with them. Right. Something exactly something else, like Frank said, all Catholics need to remember. Be patient. Exactly. Exactly. No, there's there's much to be said there. There's much to be said there. All right. Very good. Let's try the responsorial psalm. Uh, would you like to read it, Deacon Frank? Lord, you are good and forgiving. That fits right in, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in kindness to all who call upon you. Hearken, O oh Lord, to my prayer and attend to the sound of my pleading. All the nations you have made shall come and worship you, O oh Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. You, O Lord, are God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and fidelity. Turn towards me and have pity on me. Give your strength to your servant. Okay. So this, this uh, phrase here, you, O Lord, are God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in kindness, uh, it it occurs about four different times in the Old Testament, mm. and the first time we encounter it is when Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 9. Moses wanted to see God's glory, and the Lord said, you can't. You can't handle it all, and so I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and you're just going to see the backside of my glory. And so as mm. the Lord passed by, he declared his name to Moses, the Lord, the Lord. And he, he declared a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness or steadfast love and fidelity. And so what's beautiful about this scene in Exodus is God doesn't just say his name, but he declares characteristics about his name. Um, and so various times in the Old Testament, we see um, a, a, a recalling of these characteristics. Uh, especially when Israel needs forgiveness. Uh, and so Psalm 85, it's, it's a beautiful psalm about the Lord restoring his people. The, the theme throughout the psalm is how God 
will restore his people and how his people plead to the Lord to be restored. Um, and so if, if you look at if you look at it from the very beginning, you know, you're a God who's good and forgiving. You, you're abounding in kindness to all who call upon you. Hearken to my prayer, attend to the sound of my pleadings. All the nations you have made shall come and worship you. It has, has this concept that all nations will worship the God of Israel. We find this in many Psalms. Uh, you can look at Psalm 96, for instance, if you want to find another example. Uh, all nations will worship you and glorify your name. You are great and you do wondrous deeds. You alone are God. Emphasis on God's monotheistic character. He, you alone are God. When Israel was in exile uh, and they were taken away to Babylon, uh, when, they're, when they come back from exile, they rediscover well, what it is to worship one God, to be a people who are monotheistic. Uh, and so especially if you look at Isaiah chapter 41 and onward, it underlines this characteristic of how Israel is rediscovering that their God is the one God alone. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41, maybe all the way to 45 would be a good place to look. Uh, and then and then at the very end, turn towards me and have pity on me. Give strength to your servant. And so the concept of, of Israel as God's servant is a concept we find in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42 and onward. Um, and the plea for the Lord's pity, but also for strength. Um, so Psalm, 80, Psalm 85 in summary, it's a psalm that underlines the importance of restoration, and it recognizes only God can restore us. Of course, from a Christian perspective, the greatest restoration is through Christ. It's through the resurrected Christ. Uh, and so only in Christ can we have complete restoration, because only in him do we have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal salvation. Okay. Any thoughts on this song? Always, we're always reminded, right, to turn mm -hmm. to me. It's an mm -hmm. old song. Turn to me, O oh, turn and be saved. There is no mm -hmm. other. Exactly. In order to turn to the Lord, we have to turn away from things too. Yeah. And when we what fully, are... when we fully turn away from Him, mm -hmm. that's big stuff. That's we're in big. Yeah. Exactly. And that's unfortunately what Israel did is they, they often yeah. turned away. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, let's go to Romans. Let's go to Romans. Would you, uh, would you like to continue, Deacon Frank? Sure. A letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes with inexpressible groanings, and the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. Hmm. Okay, so we, we have a series of readings from Romans chapter 8, and this is really beautiful because often the church wants us to really you know, read a chapter of scripture. And, and so we do the same thing with John chapter six. For, there's a, a period in, in the liturgical calendar where we spend five or six weeks going through John chapter six. And I think this is either the third or fourth week that we've been in Romans chapter eight. It's kind of like Holy Mother Church is saying, you really should know this chapter. Uh, and it's the highlight in Paul's conversation when he talks about the justification of the ungodly in Romans chapters one through eight and underlines how our new life in the spirit is so important to be led by the spirit guided by the spirit walk according to the spirit not according to the desires of the flesh and so this this sunday though the 16th sunday we have such a small reading it's just two verses yeah the, the spirit comes to our aid to the aid of our weakness uh and it really uh, recalls what we had last week if you, if you remember the reading last week I think you have to go back to right around verse 18, where Paul says, you know, I don't consider the sufferings of this present life to be anything in comparison to the glory that awaits us. Do you remember that uh -huh. from, from last Sunday? Like, 
the sufferings that we experience, it's nothing compared to the eternal glory that awaits us in Christ. And he talked about how all of creation was groaning and waiting with eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. And so picking up on that theme, the Spirit comes to the aid of our weakness. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one who searches the heart knows what, what is the intention of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. It's a very profound reading, and, and it, it begs the question, you know, that how can the Holy Spirit be more present in my life of prayer so that, it's, that, that I'm truly guided by the Holy Spirit and aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the activity of the Holy Spirit when I pray? Um, and so, you know, the concept of the Spirit himself is interceding with inexpressible groaning, searching the heart. This is, this is very profound, you know, even in our weakness. And so um, th this is a question you can ask your people. You can say, you know, how is your life of prayer? You know, how, what, can you, what can you do to allow the Holy Spirit to be more present in your life of prayer? Um, and maybe, maybe we can bring up uh, a little bit about prayer. We could talk about contemplative prayer. You know, what is, what is contemplative prayer? Uh, you could talk about Lexio Divina, reading the scriptures and praying through the scriptures as you read them. Um, and then we, we, can, we can also uh, talk about, you know, how often do we pray with our families? A, lo a lot of families, they're so busy, they don't even take time to pray together. Um, and so there's much, much more that could be said, but I think that this would, this would um, present the opportunity to uh, preach a little bit about uh, personal prayer uh, and family prayer. Any, any other thoughts that you have in regards to this? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I would add couple prayer to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Frank, go yeah, ahead. Moment, husband and wife. I <laughs> was struck when I read this by the last two words in the third line: inexpressible groaning. Intercedes, prays with inexpressible groanings. And I'm going, isn't that what prayer ought to be? Yeah. When we pray, it should be just um, 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 fervent and not just, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. That's not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it should be for every one of us when we do it. It'd be a conversation with God, but so deeply spiritual when we do it. And wanting to pray to the lord that's like i said i was just struck by that mm -hmm. expression inexpressible groanings mm -hmm. yeah oh. thank you thank you for that thank you it's it, it's it's tied to every emotion that we have as as a human person mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else, Deacon Frank? You know what? One of the beauties of the rosary is that <laughs> they're inexpressible cronies. We don't mm. purchase, we don't say it just once. We say it over and the, the, mm. him, the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Because we we are we really want to experience his prayer to get God's attention. Not that he's not there. Mm -hmm. But we don't if we really are mm. praying. We don't just say it like Randy said, well, yeah, you saw it, but then we do it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this second line, for we do not know how to no. pray. That's right. We do. And, and I'm, I mean, this is St. This is Paul saying this, you know, and if anybody mm -hmm. knew how to pray, it would be St. Paul. And he's saying, you know, I need help. I, I, need, I need the Holy Spirit. And so oh, there, I think there's a beauty about that. I think there's a beauty of saying, I need to learn how to really pray. And, you know, re reminding us of when the disciples of Jesus asked him, his apostles, teach us how to pray. Um, and so there's, there's much here. There's much here about prayer that just two lines, though. That's, that's what really struck me, too, is that yeah. for some reason, the church just wanted two lines. And, um, you know, maybe there's something here. Uh, you know, the church is saying, you need to talk about prayer. <laughs> Please talk with them about prayer in the presence of the Holy Spirit in prayer, uh, not just, you know, not just saying words.
but really truly, truly praying with all the heart, with all your heart. Yes, okay. And, but then the last thing is, the Spirit intercedes for holy ones according to God's will. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a beautiful part of prayer as well is, you know, we need to learn how to pray as we ought. There's inexpressible groaning that's part of our prayer. The Spirit intercedes with us with that in inexpressible groaning. But we, there, there's all of our prayers must be uh, oriented to God's will, uh, always seeking His will. And that's, that's really a key to the life of prayer because if we continue to ask for the Lord's will, then we, we start to pray less for things that we want and more for things that are tied to God's will. Um, and so, so this is one thing we can even see in our own prayer life, that rather than, it's, rather than it, it being only about circumstances in our life, it will be a, that God's will would be done uh, uh, in his church, in our families, uh, in our parishes, in our own personal life. Mm. All right. Well, let's go to the gospel. Randy, would you like to, to read the gospel acc acclamation and then the gospel reading? Blessed are you, Father, heaven, or Lord of heaven and earth. You have revealed to the little ones the mysteries of the kingdom. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus proposed another parable to the crowds, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds all through the wheat and then went off. When the crop grew and bore fruit, the weeds appeared as well. The slaves of the householder came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? Mm -hmm. He answered, An enemy has done this. His slaves said to him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? He replied, No, if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot the weed along with them. Let them grow together until harvest. Then at harvest time, I will say to the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles for burning, but gather the wheat into my barn. He proposed another parable to him. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when full grown, it is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush, and the birds of the sky come and dwell in its branches. He spoke to them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of wheat flour until the whole batch was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. He spoke to them only in parables to fulfill what had been said through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce what has laid hidden from the foundation of the world. Then dismissing the crowds, he went into the house. His disciples approached him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He said in reply, He who sows good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed, the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all who cause others to sin and all evildoers. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears ought to hear. Okay. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot there. No, yeah. no kidding. Yeah, this is this is similar to last week. We had 23 verses, and this week we have 20 verses in the gospel. So we have two very long gospels. And the first thing that I always say about parables is that whenever you look at a parable, always consider this. Jesus wants us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the mysteries of the kingdom are presented to us in parables. And so it really tells you something powerful about parables, that in every single parable, we are learning about the mysteries of the kingdom. 
And here we have a collection of parables, not just one. And some of the parables are tied to when Christ will return and come again to judge the living and the dead. Uh, and so the very first parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven may be likened. And what makes this parable a little difficult to interpret is he's talking about seed again. And it reminds us of the parable of the sower. However, in this parable, the seed is not the word of God, but the seed, the seed are the children of the kingdom. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, every parable, you have to really look closely at the context uh, and be careful not to, you know, push the meaning of one uh, parable onto another. Uh, so, so the good seed, it's sown in the field, and then while everyone's asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds throughout the wheat and then went off. Um, and so our, our Lord explains that, you know, there's a difference here between the children of the kingdom and the children who don't belong to the kingdom, who belong to the enemy. Um, and so the crop appears and the servants or slaves of, of the householder, they, they, you know, they say, what, what happened? How did we get these bad seeds, you know? Didn't you sow good seed? Where do these weeds come from? And you know, what's really interesting about this parable is it addresses the question of scandal, shortcomings, problems, even, mm. among, the faith, even among the faithful. And every generation, you can study church history. There, there's, you can study the incredible saints and martyrs throughout church history who shed their blood and gave their lives but you can also see throughout church history, there were people who were unfaithful. They started heresies. They, they um, led people away from the church. They persecuted the church. Uh, they introduced false teaching. Uh, and so you, you'll see a, a mix of the good and bad throughout the history of the church, the weeds and the wheat. Uh, and so sometimes people even ask that question, you know, how can, how can we have you know, even in our own parishes, sometimes they'll get mad at somebody and say, yeah. how can a person, how can a, this person be in my parish here, you know, or how could somebody in my parish do such and such? And, you know, our, our Lord addresses that very problem. If you, if you look closely at the parable, the weeds and the wheat, he's addressing this very problem right here, uh, that this is not the, the, the weeds are not the work of the householder or God mm -hmm. or the son of man. It's the work of the enemy. Um, and so, you know, his answer to, to them in the parable is an enemy has done this. And so should we pull them up? And look what he says. No, no, no. If yeah. you pull them, if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot the wheat along with them. And that's really, it's really an amazing statement. If you think about it, if you pull out all the weeds, you're going to possibly uproot some of the wheat. It's, his, it's, it's the absolute care that he has for every grain of wheat, or maybe put another way, the absolute care he has for every single person in the church, that they would not be uprooted uh, by those uh, who don't belong to the kingdom. Uh, so let them grow together until the harvest, until, mm -hmm. Christ, until Christ comes. And then first collect the, weed, the, the weeds mm -hmm. uh, and, and tie them into bundles for burning and then gather the wheat. But what's interesting is, once again, we don't get the explanation of the parable. You know, if, if you look at this parable, he goes right, in, he launches right into another one yeah. about the mustard seed and then, and then the yeast. And then it's only later, you know, Jesus spoke this to the crowds in parables. He spoke to the crowds. Okay. And once again, it's fulfilling. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce what has been laid hidden from the foundation of the world. It's actually Psalm 78, I think. And so once he dismisses the crowds, he dismisses them. Then he speaks to his disciples. And really, I find this to be the most amazing thing about the parables is that for those who were not committed to following Jesus, who just wanted to be part of the crowd, it was only parables and there was no explanation. Hmm. That's, really, that's really amazing because it, it's very easy to be part of the crowd as opposed to really following Christ as a disciple. Uh, and there, there's something here about that, that is being underlined two different times. The same thing happened with the parable of the sower. 
in a backwards way, the gospel saying, are you part of the crowd or have you really made a decision and a commitment to be a disciple of Christ? And, and so it, it underlines that. It, it begs the question. It begs the question. And so as we listen to this parable, you know, it, it makes me ask the question, am I really seeking to be a disciple of Christ? Have I, have I really, am I, am, I, am I really making a commitment to be a disciple of Christ? Or am I just kind of going with the crowd, going with the flow? Uh, and, and so there's, a, just, there's a, a factor here where the two are distinguished. Uh, and and this is this is important because when someone has said I I am going to follow Christ and they're very committed to following Christ as a disciple, there's a difference by the way that they live their life. So like like last week's when they fell it, on various types of soil and you had the one who was as he explained to the disciples uh, it fell on loose soil and. They, they were energetic at first, and then they fell away yeah. because they had no roots. Exactly, exactly. And, and so, yeah, how can we, how can we encourage our people? And, and the, the beauty is the, the ones who come to Sunday Mass are usually the ones who are committed as disciples. So I always, like, I always tell them, you know, that, you know, I'm probably talking to people who have really made a commitment because I know that most of you who come on Sunday are very committed to living the faith and I want to encourage you to continue to live out that commitment. But when you talk when you talk with friends and family members, yeah, to to just just to help them, just to say, look, you know, we wanna we wanna understand what is the difference between just being in the crowd and really being a disciple of Christ. And it's something that you could share with friends, with family members to really help them and just say that you know, I'm I'm seeking to live the faith as a disciple of Jesus. I and struggling with different struggles, but you know, seeking to walk with our Lord humbly. And and he wants all of us to do the same with every difficulty that we have. Um, but there's a there's there really is a distinguishing factor here. And you know, you look at the crowds that followed Jesus, and there were lots of them. And over and over again, the gospel seemed to be saying, it's good that crowds are following Jesus, but guess what he really wants you to be? He wants you to be a disciple, to, to follow him as a disciple. Um, and so, and there's a big difference. Oh, yeah. So he explains the parable later to his disciples. And what's interesting, the good seed here, okay, the good seed is the son of man. So it's very mm -hmm. similar to the good seed being the word of God, you know. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. Sorry about that. The good seed is the children of the kingdom. And it's, isn't that beautiful? It's like each one of us who are children of the kingdom, baptized into Christ, who believe in Jesus, who are following Jesus, we're the good seed in this world. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. And the, we, the weeds are those who follow the evil one. The weeds are the children of the evil one. Uh, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. Uh, the word devil, it, it, it's related to the word for deceiver. Uh, the word Satan, it means accuser. So the Hebrew word Satan, it means accuser. The Greek word diabolos, de devil, deceiver. And so the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. And so just as we weeds are collected and burned up in the fire, so it would be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all who cause others to sin and all evildoers. You know, the concept of leading others into uh, scandal or sin, you see Jesus speaking against that on various occasions. They will collect those who cause others to sin and all evildoers. So there's there's a real powerful emphasis here on being a disciple of Christ, turning, turning away from every form of sin, uh, and helping others as well. And then you, 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 after he collects them and throws them into the firing furnace, there's wailing and grinding of teeth, and it says, then the righteous will shine like the sun. This is uh, from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where it talks about the resurrection in Daniel chapter 12, and it talks about those who lead others to justice will be like the stars forever. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears ought to hear. 
Yes. Any other thoughts? There's much more that we could say. We didn't even talk about the mustard seed, you know? And so in between mm -hmm. this parable, we have two others. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it goes from being the smallest of all seeds. Of course, it's not the smallest seed. You know, if you, you can find smaller seeds, but, you know, he's using a comparison here. He's not saying mathematically it's the smallest seed, but it's, it's like the smallest of all seeds. But then it grows into the largest of plants. From such a small seed comes a large plant. It becomes a large bush. And the birds of the sky come and dwell on its branches. It's, it's an image of how the kingdom will grow, how the kingdom will flourish. And then the next parable, again, uh, the, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of wheat flour until the whole batch was leavened. So once again, another image of how the kingdom would grow. Some scholars say that it mixes a good image of the kingdom growing with uh, a, a bad image of scandal in the kingdom. And hmm. it's, because, it's because leaven is often uh, associated with corruption. Uh, and you know bir the birds of the sky often have a negative context and they don't belong to the mustard, they don't belong to the mustard tree. So some will go, some will say that there's a common theme of the kingdom is flourishing, it's growing, but you also can see there's some parts that don't belong to the kingdom. Some some who don't belong to the kingdom who, who appear to be with the others who are in the kingdom. Uh, so you might find that in some commentaries, uh, depending on who you're reading. Uh, and, then, and then there might be a little bit something to it because you you do have that image, the image of of seed being planted, the kingdom growing, flourishing, the kingdom flourishing, but then finding scandal or finding problems among some. But I think overall, though, that there's a there's a beautiful message of don't let any sin take away your faith, even the even of those who you find in the church, uh, yeah. in your parish, in your parishes, wherever. Allow no one to, to scandalize you so that that will take away your faith. May your faith always be in God alone. And if you know this parable, it's, Jesus is saying, don't be surprised when you, you know, sometimes find people who they go to church, they're in the church, but, you know, they're not completely, um, they're, they're not completely part of the kingdom of God. Uh, or they need grave, you know, grave change and there, there needs to be great repentance. Any other thoughts? I think another important message, Father, is that um, to be patient. Yes. You know, we want to start hacking away at the all the, that's growing out there. And wait a minute, you know, let let's let's really listen. Let's take our time. Let's let's be merciful. Let's be kind. Eventually, they're going to get their due. Mm -hmm. But I think we sometimes are reactionary about stuff. Right. Yeah, and we and we have it often in parish groups where people will get in. Very yeah. Yeah. intense, very intense fights, you know. Mm -hmm. I always tell people it probably it's probably another parish, not our parish, right? No. But <laughs> but it happens. In some in some of our groups, people will get in the most intense rivalries yeah. and fights right. and with other people. And you know, trying to work through that and bring reconciliation is sometimes a challenge. I had uh, two thoughts. One, uh, I, I had three, but Frank took my patience one away. <laughs> um, what comes across to me is, first off, judgment. And God alone is the judge mm. of what is good and bad. That, that's what I got from the sower and the seed. Sure. He, the the uh, um, workers wanted to just uproot everything or tear out the weeds. And, and, but he said, no, let them, mm. mm. let God judge who is good and who is bad. We too often we we uh, we slap names on people and say they're troublemakers. They don't belong here. We're going to get them out. Blah blah blah. And yet we we don't let God work what God does. It's one of the reasons why I'm I'm adamantly opposed to the death penalty is because even though the individual has done something terribly wrong. There is always the possibility of redemption, and only God knows what that person does, and whether he will repent or he she will repent. But the other thing that struck me in all three of these, in a sense, um, was they all uh, the 
the wheat grows, the mustard seed grows, and in a sense, uh, the yeast grows with the bread. And that requires nutrients, mm. nutrition. And it came to my mind, I says, what has what the church provided us to do that? And then I just popped my mind, I says, they provided us the sacraments. The sacraments. Mm -hmm. The God's grace to feed us and nurture mm -hmm. us. And I think this, is, this particular set of parables uh, is something to remind folks of that fact mm -hmm. that you need some you need some feeding come to mass mm -hmm. get 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 eucharist go to reconciliation um all of it all of it is there um free free yeah. viaticum right. food for the journey food food, mm -hmm. food. nourishment yes okay. Very good. Very good. Beautiful thoughts. All right. Well, let's finish on a prayer. Uh, who do we have here? Who's who's V Ortiz? Is that somebody? Uh, are you are you logged on V Ortiz? Okay. How about Jose Campos? Would you like to lead us in a closing prayer, Jose? Yes, Father. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, thanks for thanks for the life. Thanks for our family. Uh, we ask to give us the the food we need to share with others, with our family, with uh, people from the church on, at work, that we might be a good seed to or like a yes that it needs only a little bit and then grows, that uh, we must be careful that it, it can grow the, for the good or for the bad. So let us, uh, let us to open our hearts to let God with your spirit. We pray this to the Lord our God. Amen. 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 All right. Have a blessed week, you guys. May the Lord bless you and especially your preaching and celebrations of Mass this weekend. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.